Hello everyone and welcome back once again to a special Horror Month edition of Thursdev. I'm your host Luke, and today I wanted to round off our talks for this Horror Month with an exploration of one of the cheapest, least respected tropes in horror entertainment media, the jump scare. It's a staple of schlock horror and cinematic suspense horror alike. As the creator of a piece of entertainment, it's fun to suddenly throw something at a viewer's face, usually accompanied by a loud noise, maybe a violin screech, and seeing how far they jump out of their seat. It's a cheap way to get the viewer's blood pumping and a spike in adrenaline, and though it's generally considered a cheap thrill, it persists and has been known to sneak into even some well-regarded horror masterpieces because it has its place when employed responsibly. So today, I wanted to deconstruct the jump scare and talk a little bit about how, where, when, and why to make use of a jump scare in your horror game. Before we talk about how to jump scare right though, I feel like it's important to recognize how jump scares are misused so that we can understand why there's something that we need to analyze and use sparingly in our projects. Jump scares are effective, first and foremost. Humanity may be very close to the top of the food chain, but most of us still have a very itchy trigger finger on the old self-preservation instinct, so when something suddenly lurches towards us, our first reaction is usually one of hyperarousal, to use a scientific term. It tickles the fight or flight response and we either bolt or prepare to fight back. Consciously or not, we react even to a digital stimulus because in games, movies, television, and whatever entertainment media we're consuming, we tend to become engrossed. And the more engrossed we are, the more violent the response becomes. It's not a guaranteed reaction, but the average person will likely have at least some reaction to it. So if it's effectively a guaranteed win, why shouldn't we use it all the time? Have you ever seen one of those videos on the internet where some piece of peaceful music is playing, and just as you're getting into it, something freaky pops up on screen and the volume is so high that it nearly blows out your headphones? Yes, you jump, and yes, you feel pretty high strung for a few moments afterwards, but after that, you either laugh at the ridiculousness of your own reaction, or you sort of feel cheated once the tingling in your fingertips goes away. You see, jump scares have no lasting fear effect short of any sort of personal extended physiological effects. The other day, I went to organize the closet in the guest bedroom in my house and didn't realize that my cat was sleeping in there. I threw on an old jacket and woke up and startled my cat. He hissed and ran past me because I surprised him, and I also jumped and bellowed, but neither of us were particularly frightened of the other once we figured out what had happened. I laughed and told my fiancé about it, and she laughed about it and enjoyed the fact that a tiny cat could get a rise out of a grown-ass man, but there was no real fear, no terror in it. I experienced a moment of horror, certainly. By definition, that feeling of lightheadedness and fright means that we ticked that particular box, but a real scary horror experience that relies on horror alone is conversely going to have a harder time keeping their players frightened. Back to the jump scare video analogy. If the entire video was the jump scare at the end, it wouldn't be nearly as effective because there is no buildup. The person watching hasn't started to focus yet. They're more likely just to get annoyed and turn the video or game off as soon as that happens. Likewise, if the video continued beyond that jump scare, only to try the same tactic again, it might make you jump another time, maybe even a few more times, but each time you'd be more and more ready for it to happen until it didn't bother you at all anymore. The same goes for the horror video game. You need a sufficient buildup and sufficient tension in order for it to be really effective. And overusing it makes it less and less effective. It's why the first time the dogs jump out through the window in Resident Evil, you're about ready to piss yourself. But the game never quite manages to get you as well as that one event. Now granted, I showed a clip here so that you could see it, but I'm willing to bet that most of you out there who play Resident Evil know exactly which moment I was referring to, clip or not. It was memorable, because it happened so early in the game and before you started to become desensitized to it. I'm not going to explicitly say that Resident Evil overused jump scares, but it was certainly the cornerstone upon which Resident Evil's survival horror was built, despite the fact that the scarcity and helplessness of the player character before they start to stockpile bullets was arguably much more valuable to creating the tension of the game itself. If you want examples of an overused jump scare, you need look little further than the monster closet. 
first utilized by first-person shooter pioneers id Software in their Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, and Quake series of games, it was the ultimate early gaming jump scare as you could easily walk through an empty hallway, then suddenly have a Nazi, a demon, or one of the Strogue, depending on the game, shooting you in the back. Now one could argue that the monster closets were less effective due to the fast-paced nature of the games. When you run right past it and into the next room before even the monsters appear, it doesn't really function very well as a jump scare anymore, and has largely become disused in horror FPSs as a result. Dead Space and some other games of the like tried to circumvent that by locking you in rooms with monsters that would pop out of vents in the walls, but that was only as effective as the first few times that it did it. Dead Space did, however, manage to turn the monster closet concept up a notch or two by turning any old corpse, of which there were a whole lot, into possible sources of monsters. This contextualizing of the jump scare, turning an element of the game world into one, was particularly effective in enhancing the scare factor of the jump scare. In a game where corpses are easier to find than a working light switch, the game was able to create a sense of dread whenever the player sees a dead body. It's almost Pavlovian. The first few chapters of Dead Space for this very reason were very stressful because it takes time to get into the habit of dismembering and curb stomping every corpse you find. In all of these cases, however, the jump scares do start to lose their luster quickly. You could count on corpses getting up and chasing you in Dead Space, so you did start using ammo on them. Though Dead Space had a great thing going for it in that it used a common part of the horror game to its advantage, it did oversell it and that caused it to diminish in value. Those games started to rely on the player not being sure where an attack was coming from, but always expecting attacks and stockpiling weaponry to deal with it. I will say, an element of terror is certainly introduced in the application of these monster scares because the player does begin to feel a sense of paranoia at every open room, every corpse on the floor, but it's very directed and becomes quickly expected. We want the player to feel the same paranoia, but to be unsure of how to deal with it. That's how we really create terror. If we can make anything the source of a jump scare, that means anything can become scary. It's what made the scene in John Carpenter's The Thing, where they're testing everyone's blood, so tense. We knew one of them was a monster, just not who. Instead of relying on the jump scare, though, it should be applied as a tool for the designer and used as a reward of sorts. By building tension and mounting terror through not throwing constant threats at the player and creating player character investment through some of the concepts we looked at in the last few videos, we can start the player's blood flowing over a long period of time and use the jump scare as a spigot through which all of the tension can be temporarily shunted out in a reaction from the player. Amnesia The Dark Descent was a good example of well-made jump scares. You would play the game for hours at a time, potentially, without even seeing a monster, if you were taking it slow. You'd know that they were around, you may even have evaded one fairly recently, but when one smashes down the door you're about to open, that's a really significant moment in the game, a transitioning point between creeping around the spooky castle to running for your life. By making the jump scare important and using them sparingly, we can give them more gravity, and the fewer of them you use, the less likely your players will be ready for them when you do. They're a fantastic and effective tool, but they're also a grenade. If you only ever use grenades, your players will stop panicking about them when they see one. And that's what it should be, a weapon in an arsenal of horror tricks. Yes, jump scares are cheap thrills, but if you use them sparingly and to the maximum possible effect, they'll maintain their effectiveness and you can build a few dog through window moments instead of yet another monster closet. Thank you for joining me once again for this special Horror Month edition of Thursdev. I hope that you enjoyed it and that you'll consider joining me again next week as we get back into our series on analytics and metrics aware game design. I hope that you'll drop by. Until then though, thank you as always for watching, and I hope that I'll get to see you here again very soon. Take care.